Hey, this is part two of Project Neptune. <laughs> where we design a flexible frequency discriminator and use it extreme as a guitar tuner. The previous video goes into the theory and design and is well worth it if you want to play along. Now, if that one was extreme, this one is hardcore. The focus here is learning to use Amaranth, the language formerly known as Enmigen, which lets us describe the hardware in Python. We'll walk through the entire process, also doing simulation and showing some cool ways of inspecting traces. If you've never met him, programmer Pat lives in a tiny box on the edge of your screen and he'll be your guide to going from a design like this to something that actually works on an FPGA and will be made into a real ASIC. So grab your favorite IDE and a drink and we can do this. Okay, let's go. Mmm, that new project smell. Okay, I'm gonna start by sticking everything into one big fat module, also called Neptune. I'm not gonna spend too much time uh, on basic Python stuff but I will show anything that's interesting and just edit everything else out. So I'm gonna start by creating uh, some sort of container for the notes here. And uh, I'm going to use enums because uh, I don't like typos and this allows me to make sure I don't have any and also allows for some nice uh, code completion. So first of all, the scale. We want something for no match, so not available. We'll call that zero. Now we have our scale. Um, so what I want is to have some sort of way of packaging up a, a, a note from the scale with a frequency of interest. So I'm going to call that a detected note. So these detected notes will be our individual notes that we're detecting and I want to have them in a package, some sort of container. Uh, I'm going to call it a tuning. Okay, so now we have a little container with a whole bunch of uh, little utility functions. This is overkill really, but I wanna be able to just swap this out with other stuff. Let's say I want to tune a bass. Uh, okay, so uh, if we look at this container, it's just a list of notes, of detected notes, but uh, the point is uh, we're gonna have uh, a length function to you know, keep everything um, flexible. So we can get the notes, we can get the names, we can get them by ascending or descending, we can get the highest, the lowest, you know, stuff like that. Now I'm gonna be lazy and just uh, include the standard uh, guitar tuning here uh, in this file itself, 0.63. Okay, uh, that's it. We have our standard tuning and so, that's ugly. Uh, so we go from E2, A2, D3, G3, B3, E4. Ding. You'll note that these are all funny numbers, but uh, we're going to round them out and just use <laughs> integers in real life. But since we want to multiply these and such, uh, I'm using precise values so we can get as close as, as possible. Finally, I'm going to add a little uh, classic if name equals main. And so this will just uh, output each of the notes in ascending order. So let's try that out. So if I go Python Neptune notes, ah, there you go. Let's actually do this manual style and the uh, standard. Ah, there you go. Isn't that pretty? T dot highest, haha. -ha. T dot lowest, haha. -ha. That's pretty. On to the discriminator now. Okay, now we're getting down to business with some amaranth. So the idea here is that every one of those little red blocks is going to be an object of a class. Uh, derived from elaboratable. This is an amaranth thing, so all I need to do is from amaranth uh, import elaboratable. I also need a few other things. Uh, I'm gonna need some signals. The elaboratable has an elaborate method, and uh, what it does is it prepares a module and returns that, and the system handles the rest. So that's what module is. Now, though we won't actually need this right here, uh, I do like to import the platform from the build system. Uh, that way we can have our things typed. We're going to need our note definitions here, at least the standard tunings. Neptune.notes as notes. So the important thing here when you're creating a module is to define a class, call it whatever you like. The init function can be absolutely anything you like. Standard convention is to put in here uh, whatever you need to uh, deal with your state and uh, the public interface. So any signals that are coming in or coming out, define them here. Ah, so one thing that I'm sure I wanna pass in here without hard coding it is the tuning that we're going to be using. So using tuning will be a parameter. It is a tuning and this is not optional. That's where we're gonna get our the notes that were uh, of interest. In terms of inputs, we're only gonna have one and that's basically going to be the edge count. So uh, the thing that's returned uh, from the pulse counter there is gonna give us how many edges we saw and that is a signal we will receive and, mm, 
Okay, how many bits should we give it? If we just say signal like this, this is a one bit thing. And so that's nice, it's one wire. But uh, what we need is uh, the whole count, so many bits. How many bits? So the number of bits that we're going to receive is related to how big the biggest number it is that we need to hold. And the biggest number we need to hold is related to the frequency at which uh, the highest frequency we want to detect, plus that span, that window we want, plus the fact that we need to take into account uh, how long we're sampling. If we're sampling two seconds worth, we're going to get twice the count as if we were sampling just for one second. Uh, if we're sampling for half a second, well, we can reduce everything by half. So these are parameters that we want to pass in. Uh, to the constructor. Ooh. Okay, so uh, I've added some parameters to the uh, init, to the constructor here, the duration of uh, our sample time, uh, the detection window, how, how big we want to be. I said it was 32, but uh, it could be anything. I've put it in a config here as uh, 32. Um, so I keep track of the sample duration seconds and the detection window in Hertz. Uh, then from there, I basically get the maximum frequency that were, uh, that's of interest through that tuning object. Just give me the max and give it me its frequency. Then I add in some uh, jitter and I just added the whole window. So that way we have enough bits for sure. So the max count that we can get is basically the frequency plus the headroom. So, you know, if it was 330 plus 32, 360 times the duration in seconds. So if it's two seconds, you're gonna get 700 some. If it's uh, half a second, then it'll be uh, half of that. The bits is just uh, some little math here. So I'm doing log two and then taking the ceiling so we, we, we don't chop off a bit there. And I'm keeping track of the number of bits that we have on our input. So with that number of bits, we now have defined the edge count as a signal with that number of bits. So we can hold a number that's as big as the biggest frequency that we want to detect, the number of pulses we're gonna get for this duration of sampling. And anything smaller is just gonna fit in there. Uh, so that's great. Now, uh, aliasing is kind of a problem. If you're going to be assembling something that's twice as big as your biggest expected frequency, this is probably gonna mess up. But for the moment, uh, this will do. Now, the most important output is the note that we've detected. So that is a signal with enough bits in it to represent all the uh, notes available in the tuning. The little container there has a utility function to do that math ceiling stuff. Uh, so the other thing is the proximity. What we're gonna do is use Booleans to say whether you're exactly on the note, and if not, we will care about the two other ones, which are, are you near or far? And are you above or below? So these are just uh, single bits, so all we need to do is go signal, uh, though I could do that. No point. Okay, so we have one input, which is a, a number, and we have four outputs, which is a note and three little flags. Now that we've defined our interface, uh, this is completely optional, but I find it very useful. Just define a ports a method that returns a list of all the signals that you'll want to look at traces and stuff like that for. Uh, this is for use later. And match four. Okay. Now all this stuff so far has been uh, useful internal stuff and convention. Uh, the one thing that we must absolutely do is define an elaborate method. So it always has the same signature, elaborate. The platform is useful when you're doing instantiation specific stuff. So if you want to map uh, this to the LED on the FPGA board, the platform knows where that is and you don't have to. So you just kind of use that. So elaborate's job is to create and populate a module so this, instantiate it, return it. If you don't return it, when you end up trying to use stuff, it's gonna complain and be all unhappy. This is the basic thing. We could end there, but of course our module would do nothing at all and be optimized away. Okay, this is where we get into uh, where Amaranth is kind of interesting because the important thing to remember with Amaranth is that you're writing Python, but you're not writing the hardware. You're writing the generator that will describe the hardware. So that has a couple of implications. For instance, I have a note here. Now, if I assign it something, well, I'm just putting that value into self, so that has no effect. I need to operate on the object because operator equal is just not, there's no override. So there's an equal method here. And so I can say uh, hmm, notes.scale.na. Okay, cool. However, this is happening in Python. It's not doing anything. 
what we need to do is basically add this operation to the stack of things that one of the domains, the clock domains will do. So we by default have two clock domains, the combinatorial and the uh, synchronous. And when we're doing anything clocked, well, we wanna do it on uh, the synchronous domain. So this is gonna be happening inside this module. So we take the module and there's a, a shorthand here, D for domains, and then you go sync and then you can do things like plus equals. So if I do that, then when this module is elaborated, there will be some code in there that assigns NA, whatever that value is, to the note on the clicks of the clock. Mm. Okay, so the first thing is remember to add operations on the signals to a, a specific clock domain. Okay, not too bad. The other thing is if I do this, and then I do this, uh, D, there we go. What's gonna happen? Well, the last thing that happens applies. So depending on if you've got some, some conditional code in there, some Python or even inside the, the module, you can set a signal in the sync domain and then later set it to something else. And in that clock, click the second thing, the last thing will apply. So what we're doing is by default, setting the note to NA. And if down the line somewhere in here, we go, no, 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 that is actually uh, identified, it's an E. Well, then that's what's gonna be put in there. So what I'm gonna try here is to basically do all the subtractions at once and figure out which one is within the window and set that to the note. And this is where we can control the generation here with the Python. So if I go for a note in my tuning descending, so we're gonna start with the biggest one and then go down. So for each note in this loop, I'm gonna generate some hardware that does a subtraction of the high value, the max frequency of that window, from the note uh, that I've received in the edge pulse. And if uh, that's small enough, if it's within the window, then things will happen. So I'm gonna get this max number, this max frequency for this specific note through this method that I've yet to define, and I'm going to stick it in subtract result. Now this signal has been created inside the loop, so if I've got seven notes in that tuning, I'm gonna end up with seven subtract result uh, signals with different names under the hood, but whatever. And I've set them to the size of the input bits, that way, uh, you know, even if it's a big number, we shouldn't overflow. And I'm gonna try this. I'm going to add it to the combinatorial domain. So this subtraction, will basically have circuitry that's always doing it. Whatever the edge count is, subtract result number one here will always have the value of the max frequency for E minus whatever just came in all the time, all the time. So now what I want is a conditional inside the hardware. So if subtract result at any point ends up with a number inside of it that's smaller than our window, uh, that's our note. So for conditionals, if I was writing Python, it would be if, but that's not what I want. I want a conditional inside the hardware. So we have to do some, some convoluted stuff here and we basically use the if from the module. So with m.if. Most of the things that you would expect will, will, will just work. For instance, this. So if subtract result is smaller or equal to the detection window size, that means we're in the window. In that case, we're going to override the note here and set it equal to a note dot mm, note. So now in theory, all these subtractions will be happening in parallel, and one of them is gonna say, hey, it's in the window, and that's gonna get sh shunted into uh, the note signal. But we don't have is the proximity stuff, so how about we keep a signal for that? We'll call it distance value, and that is a signal and its size is much smaller because we're only gonna assign it in these cases. So it's always between zero and uh, the detection window. So to do that, I need how many bits? I could do the uh, ceiling thing again, uh, but here's another way. You can just say range uh, detection window plus one because we want 32 to work too. So that will be a signal and it's going to be shared between all these processes. And in one case here, oh, I'm within the window. Well, we'll just set it up. So how about, I'm not too sure. If we set it combinatorially here, maybe we save some, uh, some flops. Is there a risk? Let's see, there. I'm not sure how much space this takes, and I'm not even sure how to check that out, but we're gonna try something. 
There's an easy way to get access to the Verilog for any particular module. And I'm going to show you that right here. Just by running this, we're going to spit out some Verilog. So we import the main from Amaranth Cle, and we're going to pass it our ports here uh, just because. Uh, whoops, self, dev. There we go. So now in theory, if this thing uh, doesn't have too many mistakes, it looks pretty good. Oh, this max count doesn't exist yet. Let's get that handled. Okay, so that led to a little cascade of methods here. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, we have a detection window that is this many hertz, but our sampling time might be less than a second or more than a second, so we need to adjust for that. So here, the detection window span is basically uh, the detection window with the sampling duration factored in. And as a utility, I put in the half count here with a pretty horrible name, but basically the same thing. Um, adjusted for so 16 would be if it was one second but if it's two seconds then it would the half would be 32 blah, blah. so the expected count for a given note if it was detected perfectly would be its frequency times the sampling duration cool and the max count is that expected count plus half of the window so there we go now we have our max count and we can try and run this thing so if i do this if I just run it, it's going to complain. So what you do is you say generate and you say what type you want and you get mm, Verilog. So let's pipe that out to discrim.v. So inside of here is a bunch of stuff. Oh, and there you go. See all these subtract results? Uh, subtract result 9, 12, blah, blah, blah. Just generated names. But the point is we have multiple times this signal here. So it's 9 bits. Cool. Didn't have to think of it. There it is. Blah. So my question is, is this big or it's small? I don't know. I don't even know if it works yet. But the point is I want to see how how fat this gets by doing everything in parallel to do that i'm going to use yosis so uh we can do this read verilog temp discrim shoop, and then process that so discriminator there we go we have a bunch of stuff in there and let's have a look at what it looks like uh, show colors three discriminator Okay, have a look at that. Uh, this is the logic. I'm doesn't look too big, but these blocks are see these fat arrows here. They are uh, multi bit signals. So it doesn't really tell us now I have it on good authority that tiny tape out can handle up to a 1000 gates. But I'm not sure if that means these kind of gates or the actual gates, because when you do a, a tech map, uh, basically all these things are single bit operations, a whole bunch of them. So why don't we do that and see uh, how much operation it might actually entail? So if I come here and what I do is tell Yosis to actually map this. OK, and we're going to optimize just because and show me again. <laughs> Uh, okay, hold on. <laughs> oh boy. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So in real life, <laughs> this is what it looks like on the chip. Uh, each one of these squares is a gate, and the question is, how many are there? So uh, I'm sure there's a way uh, of Yosis actually giving us a good report. I don't know what that way is at this stage, but uh, here's what we can do. We can go into the discriminator and take a look. What this says is that we've got at least 2,000 simple map op and other things, I think. Hmm. Are these just random numbers? No, they're sequential-ish. Oh, they've been optimized away. Hmm. Too many uncertainties. I'm going to use an FSM and then maybe experiment with this stuff later. So let's go with the FSM route. Going to call this parallel and define an elaborate state machine. Okay, so the state machine basically starts in init and it sets the current node index to zero and it immediately moves on to calculate diff from target here. Uh, then it goes, okay, let's say it was a first one, so test ascending, it'll be the highest node, so 330 hertz plus uh, 32 or whatever, 16, minus the edge count. And that's all it does. It stores that in subtract result and then it goes on to compare. Next tick. 
we end up in compare and if the result is smaller than the uh, window span there we're close to this note whatever that note was the first one in this case so bang we can already set here uh, the note so so let's say we started with the, the, the small e, that goes in here, and we go and say, oh, we detected a valid note. Interesting note here is that the MD sync thing, the plus equal, also accepts uh, a list, basically arrays of stuff, so that you can make it cleaner than having a plus equal, plus equal, plus equal. So that's it. Uh, we detected a valid note, so we now know that the note is in note, and we have our subtract result, which has some value that's smaller than the span. So we go to detect valid note, Let's see, here we go. This is where all the stuff happens that uh, determines the proximity. So uh, here we go. If it's smaller than the half, then we're smaller or equal to 16. That's straight up our thing, and we were higher than the target, or exactly on it. Uh, if it was the other way around, that's the logic I explained before, we do this uh, extra subtraction here, and then we say, uh, remember, the uh, input frequency was actually lower than our target. Then we go on to display the result, which is where the stuff happens where we end up setting these flags. So basically it's a bunch of logic that I already explained, but we're setting this flag here or there or there or there. And then finally, uh, since we found this note, we're all happy, we move back to init and do another uh, sample. Now, the case where uh, things didn't work out and we didn't detect the note is basically a path where we increment the index and we check if um, we happen to be beyond the array and then we re-init and if not we just keep moving on and go into these circles. So that's pretty much it. Now the question is, is this bigger? Let's find out. I had only implemented, you know, this has everything in it, so it's bound to be a, a little fatter than, than the other test. But uh, if we take a look in here, let's produce the Verilog. Okay, what have we here? <laughs> well, this looks kind of fat, and this is not even the tech map. Look at all of this stuff. Okay, let's check the tech map. So let's tech map it and optimize it and clean it which is probably does nothing and show it oof is it so heavy that it won't even load <laughs> okay instead let's uh check out what this says oh oh no well thousands thousands okay mm, i think we're just going to have to hope here <laughs> check check what came out look at this oh, 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 oh no so many wires okay i don't know this doesn't seem like i'm asking too much look at the edge count everywhere it goes okay this seems big but hey this is my first tiny tape out maybe maybe it'll fit so let's just finish this put it on an fpga and see what happens now, working backwards from this, uh, what comes in is the edge count from the uh, pulse counter. So I'm going to do that. It might not be all that interesting. Give me a second. Okay, we'll see. Uh, now, we've got some code here, and it's uh, it maps, but does it do what we want it to do? It's time to do a little test here. And instead of uh, installing CocoTB and getting all this stuff, uh, I'm just going to trace some signals and see what happens. Basically, I have a few functions I created, but we're going to start with uh, this tuner test exact here. And so I'm going to run a simulator and I'm going to clock it at one kilohertz and assume that everything is fine. So one kilohertz for one second. Yeah, that's fine. Na -na. Okay, we now have the uh, GTK wave files available. So let's take a look at what came out of this test. Okay, this is GTK Wave. What is it? Alt F. There we go. Uh, okay, so the edge count here is, uh, let's put it in decimal because that's much easier. 82 hertz, 110, that's A. So E, A, blah, blah, blah. So here we go. Uh, we see that after, well, look, GTK Wave gives us all our stuff. We can basically look at anything, but the ports are what show up by default here. This six is E, and then A is two, five, five, what would be next? D, this is working. So all the matches are exact because my test here was very simple. So instead of doing that, let's say 
And let's not test exact. Let's do a tuner test. We'll just do one note. Uh, so that'll be the E. And we're going to test it exactly on the frequency. And then seven, 7 hertz too high, 4 hertz too high, 4 hertz too low, 7 hertz too low. OK, GTK wave. Here we go. We're only doing note 6 here. But if you look, when the frequency is exactly on, then we have an exact match and we don't care about the rest. Here it's a little too high and it finally figures it out and it goes, okay, we're no longer exact. We are far and high. Here it's high still, but not, uh, not far. Here it's low. It is not far and is not high and it is not exact. So it seems to work. We're detecting the uh, notes in question. We're saying this is an E. We're detecting when they're high and low and far and close. There's a little delay before the uh, things take effect, but that's normal because that state machine is doing its thing. Uh, but it is working. These flags are showing up. So mm, I'll just do the pulse counter, show you if anything interesting pops up, and then we'll do the edge detector because that one is actually interesting. All right, I did the pulse counter and it turns out it's actually a little bit interesting. One thing I decided is it's so bound up to the edge detector that it's basically going to instantiate that module within itself and just have its input fed directly into that and monitor the edge detector module's output internally. I also decided uh, something about clock frequency. Now on one of these little FPGA boards, you have a, a clock, it's three megahertz or whatever it is. But for tiny tape out, no one forces you to have a clock or not or whatever. So you basically decide where it comes in and what its rate is going to be uh, within the limits of what it can handle. So what I did was basically set up a little uh, helper module here with various clock frequencies. And we're going to have two bits on the input that are dedicated to uh, uh, setting the clock. I, I, I want to have the opportunity to have a clock at one kilohertz, two kilohertz, four kilohertz, and this weird three, two, seven, seven, because, uh, you know, it's super easy to get an oscillator at 32.768 K and I'm just going to divide it by 10 and that'll be the clock. It's fast enough to, uh, give some decent performance and it's easily available. The point is, uh, in the pulse counter, uh, you basically have input pulses sanitized by the edge detector, which uh, remains to be done. And uh, then what happens is you tell it, okay, I want to be sampling for a certain number of seconds. That's it. With the uh, clock bits and those number of seconds, it figures out how many clock ticks it has to count for. And after those ticks, it'll report whatever it's accumulated in the, in the running uh, pulse counter here. So here's that. And there's some little uh, stuff here. The synchronizer num stages is going to be used by the edge detector. So we have an input signal. So that's the raw digital input from the outside world. It comes in, the clock uh, config bits come in, and the pulse count comes out. This is a signal that has the same size as the maximum number of clocks we might count. So if you're using four kilohertz and sampling for two seconds, that number's pretty big. But the point is, we might, under some circumstances, get that many pulses counted. So this signal is that large. So in the elaborate, some, some housekeeping goes on, but here's an interesting part. Combinatorially, I'm tying the input to the edge detector input, which will exist. And so that's just a wire, it's just one signal. Um, also, in the synchronous domain, the clock count signal here is incrementing on every tick. That's it, that's, that's its job. Here's an interesting one. I'm using this switch within the module, within the generated code here. I'm going to loop over, so I have a switch that has case statements for the clock config bits. And depending on what that is, it'll set this period clock count. This is the number we want to, the number of ticks we want to count to. Uh, but I'm leveraging the Python here to not write four case statements for something that's so stupid. I'm just looping over the possible clock values and saying with case look, and this will generate the Verilog accordingly. So uh, after that, uh, that's it. We're basically counting. If the current clock count is where we're headed, so let's say it was a four kilohertz clock for one second. So this number here, single period clock count will be 4,000. If clock count is 4,000, okay, we're done. We reset the clock count and we report our pulse count. If it's not done, if we just started, this is a new cycle. So we reset the pulse count and we do it smart so that we don't lose a pulse because 83 hertz is just is not that many pulses. We can't lose too many. So that's one thing. And if we haven't just started, well, that's it. If the edge detector says hello, uh, that's a pulse. If it doesn't, nothing happens. The end, on to the edge detector. 
So for the edge detector, the main thing is sanitizing that input like we've been talking about. And it really isn't that much work, but it's something you need to take care of when you're crossing clock domains. So basically, uh, Amaranth already handles this for you. So if you go amaranth.lib.cdc ff synchronizer, there we go. This is Oh, there's a little description here. Can you see that? Resynchronize a signal to a different clock domain. So all it really is, is a chain of flip-flops. Two at a minimum, you can have more. And what it does is, yeah, that signal might come in at a wrong time and cause some instability, but at some point it'll settle. Normally, it'll happen before the next clock, and our clock is so slow that there's really no problem there. Uh, but the point is, this is how you do it. It'll generate whatever's needed there, the, the flip-flops, but all you have to give it is the number of stages, and then feed the input and read the output. So watch. So I've got my input and my output. That's it, just one in, one out. And I'm gonna keep track of the number of stages here for uh, the elaboration, because that's where we're gonna create that FF synchronizer. Okay, so here it is. This is the constructor for the FF synchronizer. Something I forgot to mention with the other thing where I was using the edge detect inside of the pulse counter is that you basically, and that's nice, you can instantiate it, but for it to be added to the module and actually included, you need to do this, m.submodules. So I like to give them names. I called it FF sync. Uh, this pattern here equals equals is a way to have access to that object down the road, but actually we, we don't need it here. Uh, the constructor is basically give me an input, uh, give me something to output to, and give me the number of stages. We really only need two, but I left it as a parameter here. The point is, uh, that's it. You create the synchronizer, and then here I go. My output is zero here, by default. If nothing else happens, the output will be low from the edge detector. If the synchronizer output is high, it will stay high until the next cycle. If the synchronizer output is high, and I haven't seen it rising, my clock will go, my, my output will go up. In every other case, because I'm setting this scene rising flag, next time I come in here, sync out will be high, but scene rising won't. So what will take precedence is this guy. So in essence, uh, I'm just basically always setting the output up for one clock cycle, and that's it. Uh, if uh, the sync out is low, uh, I can clear the scene rising flag. That's it, that's the edge detector. Mm. So now we don't have any errors here. I can actually run this test. Let's see what comes out of the pulse counter. So this is basically testing both the pulse counter and the uh, edge detector. So I'm testing the pulse counter and it's a good opportunity to talk about uh, generating these traces. I have a test function here in my main. I'm saying, okay, if we're testing, we'll just call it test. And test basically creates uh, the module in question, the pulse counter. I'm setting the sampling duration for one second. And what I'm doing here is calling this helper function that you can check in the source. I'll release that. But the point is it just runs this stuff now and you give it a function to run. Here's the function that's gonna run. So the important thing here is you're, you're you're using the uh, device under test here, this module, and you're accessing the various signals and stuff. And you could do dot equal and da da da, but in this case, you're actually running it. So uh, you're not doing m.domain.sync plus equals blah blah blah. This isn't going to generate Verilog, it's actually running. But the way it runs, you have to yield and yield from. So in essence, what I'm doing here is going yield whatever I want to do. So here's I'm setting the clock config to one kilohertz, and then I'm just pulsing for two seconds at 110 hertz, pulsing for a little over a second at 300 hertz, and we'll take a look at that. And then I'm doing the same thing. I could just keep pulsing at 300 hertz. Okay, my actual clock frequency is one kilohertz. Uh, but I keep extending the time because I'm changing this, uh, the apparent, the stated clock frequency using those bits. So I'm setting the clock config to two kilohertz, four kilohertz, and that weird 3277. Always using 300 and giving it enough time to reach its pulse count because I'm actually only going there. So with that extra time, we're going to get more pulses and the reading should increase accordingly. So let's run this stuff and see what comes out. Okay, so now let's check the waves. Okay, so I made them fatter because they're easier to see, but now we have less screen. But let's uh, see the whole sequence here. In essence, what I've got is this input coming in here. Let's take a look here first. So the input is whatever it is, uh, 110 hertz or 330 or whatever it is. And the output is from the edge detector. 
So you can see that the edge detector is in the pulse counter and it has its output and you can take a look at it. And as you can see, it happens one clock wide and it's kind of delayed because there's some processing involved. Each of those things takes steps. So there's actually a maximum frequency at which this is gonna stop working. Uh, but the point is under here is the actual clock at one kilohertz. And uh, you can see that Mm -mm -mm. Each of these pulses lasts, well, it lasts a whole, hmm, is that normal? Yeah, I guess so. It lasts a whole period and then it goes away, regardless of the size of the input. So, uh, more interestingly, here are the clock config uh, bits. And this is zero, zero, so one kilohertz, and then two, and then whatever. And here's the reading. So as expected, 110 uh, at the beginning. Then I switch the frequency to uh, 300. And then I start playing with the uh, clock bits, the clock config bits. And so you can see that uh, after the requisite amount of time to accumulate 2,000, 4,000, and 3,277 uh, ticks, uh, the number reported is much higher than it reports a frequency of 300 which is valid at first and then 600 because we said the clock frequency doubled but it didn't um, and then 1200 and then 983 so the pulse detector is working and gtk wave is a pretty sweet way of of just verifying all that and seeing seeing things are behaving as you expect them so cool uh one note about that is uh it gets annoying always uh redoing these configs and setting this to decimal and da da da. So what I do is I basically open up the GTK, GTKW file that was provided and then I do my customizations and then I do write save file as block and then that's what I open. So all I have to do now is reopen that same file and we get, we get everything. So that's that. What's left might just be glue. Oh no. <laughs> What's left is the display, so the output. So this is where uh, the discriminator's only been kind of tested and we're going to be able to put everything together with the display. So let's start with that and I'll show you another neat uh, GTK Wave trick with that. Okay, I think I got the display done. I segregated it all into its own little uh, sub package here. First off, a little bit of housekeeping. I just created uh, this sprite thing, which is just a way to hold the segments with uh, an associated name and the sprite sets, which are sets of related sprites like the uh, scale notes or uh, the proximity stuff. The only interesting thing about the sprite set is uh, there's a few little utility functions and there's this thing, two array. And two array is uh, of interest because what it does is it sorts them in a specific way and it returns an array object here, which is an amaranth thing. Uh, and that's important because uh, this will be used inside of the module. So we need this array to be accessed by index within the module, not in Python. So uh, that's one thing. The sprites themselves are uh, how I defined basically what this stuff is gonna look like. Uh, made some compromises on the proximity stuff, but uh, check it out. So I've got all my uh, scale values here associated to some bit field. It's basically segment A, B, C, D, uh, all the way to the dot. The dot's ignored, but whatever, it's there. So this forms an A, a B, a C, a D, you know, like that. Not too complicated. So that's all it is. It's just a derivative of sprite set and it sets these sprites in the set. Same thing with proximity. Uh, I found a way to kind of say mm, you're close, you're far. Basically, I'm using the vertical lines to say you're below or you're above. And the horizontal bar is far away from the middle if it's far away. And it's towards the middle if it's close by, but not exact yet. When it's exact, it'll just go blank. So that's what I have there. Now, with all this housekeeping done, uh, that makes seven segment displays pretty damn easy. Check it out. This seven segment display is a module elaboratable and all it has is a sprite set that you pass to it. You say, okay, this display is going to have these sprites. And then it has a value which is big enough to accommodate any of the indices of the various sprites. So it's related to the length of the container and it has segments eight, just because there are eight segments, even though we're only using seven on each. The elaborate method with all this is uber simple. Uh, all you do is get that sprites to array, and then you say, hey, if this value makes any sense, if it's smaller than the sprites, then the segments are assigned the value of this map at index value. The end. 
So uh, this way we could basically create any kind of display just by setting up a, a set of sprites and then creating one of these things. The dual segment display is this guy. And it's basically just taking, it's a little more specific. It has an input for the note and an input for the proximity, which is a combined version of those three flags there, the match far, exact, and uh, high or low. It has uh, eight segments because that's all that's coming out. And well, seven and the proximity select. So that's the cathode switch. It'll just do that like that. So when we elaborate this thing, what we do is we instantiate two seven segment modules and we associate them or we we assign them to different names so that way there are sub modules that will be included in this module uh, then all we do is uh, assign the appropriate um, value to the value of the display in question so the note goes to the note and the proxim goes to the proxim finally what we're going to do is uh, basically alternate the proximity select on and off we're assigning the negative here. So every clock cycle, it'll flip. When proximity select is high, uh, we're normally switching on the proximity thing, but I don't actually have an NA value for that. So I'm basically setting it to uh, the note NA, which is the little bar. Um, otherwise, uh, let's say the, the, the note is actually valid. Then we're going to set the proximity uh, display to the segments that are related to uh, whatever we got based on the signal that we can't that came in and that's it okay so to test this i basically have uh, that same little system a little test system here and what i'm going to do is set a note to something and then do okay we'll set the proximity to exact and then to low uh, but close and then high but close and high before and then i'll change the note here just to be fun and that's it so let's run that and see what comes out so I prepared a little file here called 7 Seg Translate. And if you take a peek inside, this is what you see. Basically, uh, it's a translation file for the seven segment display. Now we're in luck that the notes and the uh, proximity stuff uh, don't collide, but whatever. Uh, the point is you put here what you're uh, expecting to see in the in the trace. And to the right of it, uh, white space later, is uh, what you would like to see instead, because I don't want to have to parse 0100011. So there you go. And now if we go GTK wave, well, nothing has changed because uh, we haven't told it anything. But let's do this. The segments. See, if I put them in binary, yeah, I get my 010101. And now if I go translate a filter file, enable and select. Mm, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a little pop-up. And I'm going to select that file. Well, there you go. Isn't this pretty? And uh, neat thing is, so exact A. And we can go... Where does this change? So here the proximity stuff changed. We're low but close. And then we're high but but close. And then what's this? High and far. So that matches what we're expecting. So that means lots of things. Uh, it means that the translation file is hella useful, but it also means that, so in essence, we're getting what we expect and the display does seem to be working. So now all that remains is to tie everything together. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard. It's all about uh, connecting bits to other bits uh, using combinatorial logic. Let's do it. Okay, so let's create a module called uh, Tuner because that's uh, the whole thing. So I'm calling a class Neptune, and it is, of course, elaboratable. Now, I want to pass in basically all the important uh, build time parameters here. So the tuning and stuff like that. So all we need is the tuning, the sampling duration in seconds, and uh, the input synchronizer stage. I guess it's not really required, but it'll be fine. So other than just making note of the parameters passed in, uh, we basically have uh, two inputs, uh, the single pulse pin and the clock config. And in terms of output, it's just the display driver stuff. So time to elaborate. Okay, so now I've got my input, which will go into this uh, pulse counter. I've got the discriminator, which will get stuff from the uh, pulse counter and spit out to the display. I've separated them out like this because it allows me to have uh, code completion more easily than using that nice little terse 
equal equal thing. Now it's all about tying everything together. So uh, because these are just wires, we just want to click one thing into another. It's all going to be combinatorial and I'm just going to make a big list. So the input pulses go to the input pulse counter. So does the clock config. All the inputs go there. The edge count comes from the pulse count. The note from the discriminator goes into the display. I'm using cat here to concatenate these three single bits into one three bit signal. And then I'm uh, spitting out the display on my own output on the tuner output. Psh. Okay, cool. So in theory, uh, this would be all that we need for the module, but I want this to be my top for the FPGA. And what that means is that we have to actually do some extra stuff to wire it to the platform. This is where platform stuff uh, comes into effect wire for platform and I'm going to pass it the module we've just prepared and the platform itself. Okay, did that and now uh, I had to do some extra importing here uh, and I'll show you why. So there must be a better way to do this. Um, I'm just not aware of it. Uh, so I just kind of reuse this template every time I'm messing around with the FPGA. In essence, I'm calling wire for uh, wire for platform all the time. And if the platform isn't set, like when I'm just generating Verilog uh, randomly like before, uh, then this just goes, oh, that's empty and goes back. So fine. However, if we do have a platform and it is the platform I expect, the ICE 40 HX one blah, 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 that I'm using, uh, then uh, we're going to do some stuff. So. I uh, prepare these little tuples here because I need them down here. And what I'm doing, the weird thing here is that you basically take your platform, add some resources that you can name the however you want, and then get those resources and use them however you want. Maybe this is an optional step that I could skip, uh, but uh, I don't I want to deal with pin seven and pin nine and pin blah, blah, blah. So what I'm doing is I'm uh, basically defining, okay, on PMOD one from that module, where is it? So on PMOD one from this module here, you've got pins that are uh, power and then IO, same thing on this guy. So this is one and six or six and one. Anyways, the point is uh, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to put pin seven, eight, nine is going to be the A segment and the E segment and blah, blah, blah as this is defined here. Now I didn't choose these. The uh, dual segment display here is designed to fit into these two PMODs. I have a standard width between them. So uh, that's all I'm doing here is I'm naming all these uh, sub signals. Uh, finally, I'm also uh, doing some things that are up to me. I'm using the second row of PMOD 1 to give me the stuff that I need for input. So the signal, uh, the clock, and the clock config bits. Once that's done, I request the uh, resources I just created and I hook everything up. This is basically boilerplate. I take the sync clock domain and then I put it into my domains and then I do a combinatorial connection between everything. So display segment seven is going to uh, display pins AA and six is going to B, C, and same thing for all the other ones. On the input side, I'm taking the uh, external clock that I'm gonna be feeding into one of these pins and uh, making that uh, my clock domain. And I'm taking the input pulse, putting that in the right place and taking the two pins and sticking that into clock config. Okay created a little test system that will basically uh, just exercise thing. I'm creating Neptune using the standard tuning and uh, I'm sampling for half a second in this case. And then I'm just going to test everything. I'm going to do some stuff playing with the clock and uh, toggling the input at various frequencies that look like uh, scale notes that we, that we love. So that's one thing. Now the build stuff. Building it for the platform requires information about the platform. And that comes from somewhere. This is Amaranth boards. It's a whole package here, which uh, you can get online and it has a bunch of boards and it's really not all that complicated what's in there. You could define your own, but the point is uh, you can just import your dev platform here and then the build call is instantiate the platform dot build and then your top level module. And then do you want to burn it? That's it. That's all you have to call from uh, if name equals main. So that's what's happening uh, here. So let's build a not burn. Uh, I don't want to plug that in right now and just see if it works. Tune, tuner. That took a little while. But build. Here we go. So we've got everything here. Discriminator. Ooh, look at that. Okay. So that's one thing. Pulse counter. Okay, 
I don't know. That looks good. How about we put this on an FPGA? Okay, check it out. Channel one is our uh, external clock. It's at one kilohertz, zero to 3.2 volts here. And it is running. And we can see that the uh, device here has its display on dash dash. I don't know what's going on. If we go to channel two, I'm at 146. 146 is a D. What do we see? Oh, it's a D, look at that. Okay, let's uh, move around a little bit. Frequency. Let's go in tiny steps. So 147. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So look at that. 148, 149. We're hmm, pretty much uh, too high, but close. 150, too high, but close. Oh, oh. That's 151 oscillating there. 152, definitely too high. Let's go down the other way. This is 140, oof, two, three, what's, what's going on here? Well, we got some range here, huh? Oh, okay, we're far down. Oh, seem a little tighter on the low end here. Okay, let's go up to the next note. That would be, so now we're D very high. Now we're nowhere. And that's uh, 163. The next note is at 196. So yeah, that makes sense. Nothing. Nothing. Whoa. Kind of a glitch because we're moving around, I guess. Ah, there we go. G, way far low. Moving up, moving up. Getting there. Okay, now we're low, but close at 188. We're looking for 196. Uh, 191. Oof. Okay, it says we're good. 197, we're still, whoops. 98. 99, we're too high, we're too high. This might be too much play. I'm not too sure what our ears can tell here. But okay, uh, 200. Let's see, what's the next one? Okay, we're out at 215. Doesn't know where we are. Whoa. Already detecting that we're getting close to B around 227. And we're looking for 246. Wow. That's some good range. Okay. 236. We're still far low. Well, now we're close low. Kind of uncertain. 240. Now it's calling it good. Maybe the 32 was too big of a range. So now at 249, we're kind of blinking on too high. Way too high. Next one is far away at 330. I think the half second is working though. Let's go up by tens. This is four, 500. Let's try six, six. Oh, here we go. Now it thinks we're in E. Okay, now we're failing with our one kilohertz clock. We're getting some weird crap. Okay, how about we go down to the lower frequencies? 70 hertz. Low E. Oops, I'm going by 10 still. Close to low. Calling this E. That's probably bad. 85. Well, 84, still good, it's 83. 85 is unhappy. But we're good, way lower than I expect. Something a little off. But in short, this does seem like it's working. Uh, A would be 110, right? Yeah, here we go. Bang, hi. This is great. Neptune rises. Fantastic. We built a tuner.
<laughs> okay, that's fantastic. I'd like to end on a win, but I think we could squeeze in just a little bit more and uh, actually get Tiny Tape Out going. So uh, we did all the hard stuff. All we need is a little wrapper for Tiny Tape Out now, and it's super simple. I'm going to create another uh, module that's going to be the top, TT Top. It's going to reuse the same constructor as uh, the other thing. And all it has uh, that's different here is basically only eight in and eight out. So self IO in. So eight in, eight out. Now all we have to do is elaborate, uh, instantiate a tuner, put it in the stub modules and tie everything together. Okay. So uh, the elaborate just uh, creates this uh, tuner thing and sticks it as the only uh, sub module in this module. Uh, it does that same uh, clock domain stuff that we did with the FPGA. Uh, this is basically boilerplate, except for uh, one difference here. Uh, we don't have an, a reset signal or anything on the platform, right? So uh, we're basically going to say, okay, IO in zero is the clock. IO in one is the reset. And we're going to be able to have a reset. Um, in terms of inputs, we have this stuff. So we're taking the two next pins, two and three, and combining those together and saying that's the tuner clock config. Cool. Uh, the input pulse comes in on four, so it's nice and far away from the other clock. Not that it probably doesn't matter, but anyways. Uh, okay, the outputs. We're concatenating uh, those seven segments that we're actually using and the switcher uh, into one blob here, doing a little sanity check and then just assigning them to IO out. So that's it. Now all we need is a little main that'll uh, spit out Verilog that'll work with tiny tape out. Now this is boilerplate that I basically took somewhere else. I can't even remember, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're doing tiny tape out, you need some name with your GitHub ID or something like that. But the point is this will just instantiate that top module that has the tuner inside and does all the connections. It'll spit out some Verilog that we can stick into a tiny tape out project and hopefully process that stuff, get a GDS, it fits, hooray, we're ready to submit. So let's try it out. Verilog has been spat. Okay, so let's keep this. Uh, this is Neptune TT.V. Uh, Neptune TT.V. It's all my stuff, it's all my stuff. <laughs> okay, now the moment de vérité, we get to find out if it fits in tiny tape out. <laughs> Check this out. All right. Uh, if you're curious how I got to this screen, well, uh, see my last video on this playlist, but short version is it fits in tiny tape out and there's even some room to spare. Uh, maybe I will try a couple of different things, but uh, for starters, here we go. Everything is concentrated down here. The inputs are here. Let's see. Uh, yes. So this is IOO, IO1, and then the clock stuff, the bits, and here's our input signal. And then nothing's connected to the IO, uh, the inputs, and then the outputs are all connected to various stuff, uh, which is the segments and all that. So, wow, this works. Uh, what I'm gonna do is uh, package this up and put it on GitHub so you can play it too. Um, if you're curious about the uh, analog to digital conversion, uh, let me know and I'll publish something on that. Uh, my next thing is probably gonna be some more in-depth testing because so far, yeah, it, it kind of works, but and I have some ideas about how to uh, make that window a little more proportional, a little smarter. And it looks like we may even have room to implement that. So mm, this is pretty cool. Uh, I've got some stuff coming up uh, on KiCad. I've got some pick and place uh, updates. I've got a bunch of stuff, but uh, first off, I'm gonna get this into the submission queue. Tiny Tape Out's next uh, rollout or submission date deadline is like the 24th or something like that. So I'm gonna zip zap and uh, put that in and maybe even do a couple of derivatives. Anyhow, I really hope you enjoyed this journey. <laughs> I'm really glad that it worked. Hooray for Neptune. Neptune Extreme.